Welcome. Good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for joining me and Mr. Dan Dustin, who everyone I'm sure knows. Dan, great to see you. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you. Thank you. And we wanted, Dan and I wanted to put this webinar together for everyone to discuss the, the important issues of CPA mobility and of course, substantial equivalency and the 150 hour requirement for licensure. As you all know, there's a lot going on out there in the world um, and we have a lot of questions around these words that we often throw out very easily. Uh, just yesterday, we had an ARPL committee meeting where all three professions, architecture, engineering, and CPAs were throwing around substantial equivalency and it really dawned on me that it's such a word that we use often and it's a word that many of us still have questions about and have mysteries and wonders behind. And so Dan, I appreciate your time, especially as a former regulator, a CPA and leadership within NASBA to meet with us today and explain these big issues that are very important to the profession and to the regulation of the profession. Thanks, Marta. It's really a great opportunity. You know, we've at NASA have tried to focus on talking about the history of how we got to where we are today because we see such turnover both with the executive directors across the country. I think we've had more than 30 new executive directors in the last couple of years. And then we recognize that board members, you know, turn over about 20% a year. So while some of us have been around working on this for 20 or 25 years, uh, there's a lot of new faces in the crowd that we, we need to touch on these things periodically. Absolutely, and the conversation does not stop today. I think Dan and I will scratch the, the very top of this issue and we'll have plenty more opportunities to engage all of you in various capacities, but we hope this is of value to you today. So let's look at what the agenda um, looks like for today's webinar and what we will cover today. Um, of course, you know, history and context is important. And so one of the first things you'll, of course, discuss is how did the profession get to 150 hours? Um, that big old question of what is substantial equivalency and what role does substantial equivalency play within CPA mobility and also firm mobility? And then we'll sort of round out that discussion. As many of you know, um, the Minnesota Society introduced legislation today um, regarding um, uh, 150 hours plus additional pathways into the profession. And um, NASBA, through their letter to the Society and to the AICPA, we received our letter on January 10th, outlined what that legislation means and the consequences of that legislation regarding substantial equivalency. And there were a few bullets within that letter. And so we will go through what those bullets mean and um, how they will be applied um, to CPAs and to firms within a jurisdiction that is no longer substantially equivalent. And then of course, we're open to Q and A. Please use the chat function, please send them in and Dan and I are happy to answer them. So. Dan, I'll sort of turn things over to you to get us started about 150 hours and how we got here. Sure. Thanks, Marta. You know, I, I kind of uh, love the history uh, aspects of this. Uh, last April at the Executive Directors Conference, we spent some time talking about the 150 hour requirement. And I wanted to start with a quote, and I did this last year, so some of you have heard this before. But the quote says, there is one major problem confronting the accounting profession that will occupy the attention of the administration of the Association of University Instructors in Accounting. The avenues of entry into the practice of accounting are not clearly defined. It seems to me that time has come for the practitioners and the teachers of accounting to attack this problem with a view to establishing a relationship that compares with other professions such as law, medicine, and engineering. And the thing I found most uh, ironic about this was it was written by R.A. Stevenson in 1931. So 90 years ago, we were talking about education and licensure. The other thing I found interesting was that in the 1950s, only three jurisdictions required a college degree to become a, a CPA. And uh, certainly as this map shows, 
Florida passed legislation in 1979, and uh, that law became effective in 1983, and they're the first state that adopted the 150-hour requirement. Certainly, there was a lot of activity in, in the 70s and the 80s that, that led up to that, so there was a focus both within AAA and the AICPA, and, and also uh, AACSB. Certainly, AACSB today represents about uh, in their accrediting body uh, for accounting schools and business programs. And they represent about 65%, or I should say 65% of candidates for the exam today graduate from an AACSB accredited business program or accounting program. And so there were 18 in 1982 when this first happened. Today, there are 724 business schools accredited by AACSB, and there are 181 business and accounting programs. So a lot of change has occurred in the last 20 years with respect to accounting education. So, so once we get beyond uh, you know, 1980s, we get into the 90s, we see by the end of the 90s, we had 18 jurisdictions. But what's interesting is by the end of the 2000s, uh, we actually got up to 48 jurisdictions uh, with respect to adopting uh, the 150 hour education. That'll be on the next slide. Uh, one thing that's, you know, I found interesting that really the watershed period was probably in the early 2000s. We saw a, a number of jurisdictions adopt uh, in the late 90s and it rolled over into 2000, 2001, 2002. But as you can see, by the end of the 2000s, by 2009, 48 jurisdictions had adopted uh, 150 hours of education. And then if you, you move on to the, the next slide, it's, you know, by the 2010s, it was really 2015, 2016, uh, we had Colorado, they were, they had adopted 150 hours and it was rescinded, then they readopted it. We had Virgin Islands as the last jurisdiction to adopt uh, in, the, in the mid, you know, 2010s. Uh, what I thought was interesting and in some of the background, again, the history, I, I went back and I found an article that was written about the Florida Institute of CPAs and, and what the objectives were back in the, the late 70s and the early uh, 80s with respect to adoption. And, and their objectives included things like uh, provide an academic background that will support the knowledge expansion of the profession over one's career span, broaden the person's knowledge beyond just accounting and the technical knowledge to include other things, increase accounting expertise, increase the overall standards of entry to the profession, increase the levels of personal integrity and professional ethics. And certainly today we see a lot of boards of accountancy rules that require ethics training, enhance communications and interpersonal skills. So here we are talking about that in the 80s. And yet today you hear the firm still talking about the fact that we need you know, those soft skills like written and oral communication. Uh, increase the pass rate on the CPA exam. Well, if we look back to the you know pre uh, 2004 paper and pencil, pass rate was about 17 percent. With CBT, it increased to about 33 percent, and today, for the most part, it's in the you know low 50 percent range. So certainly, we've seen an increase in the pass rate on the exam, uh, and, and provide that educational background uh, and to attract the best and the brightest. And, and Marta, what I, what I also found interesting that, you know, things haven't changed. When we look to what we did with CPA Evolution, you know, four or five years ago, we talked about the fact that between the, two, the 1980s and four or five years ago, there were three times as many pages in the Internal Revenue Code, four times as many accounting standards, and five times as many auditing standards as there were uh, just that short time ago. And then we, we look at you know, what we talked about, the body of knowledge that newly licensed CPAs need. You know, we talked about, we shared slides about things like critical thinking, professional judgment and professional skepticism, problem solving, understanding the business environment, whether it's systems or controls or risk environment. You need to know that thing. And certainly data analytics and data management is key. And I think we see that with the changes that are happening with the exam uh, next year in 2024. So a lot of uh, change has occurred over the years uh, with uh, education. And, and I, you know, I, I really believe that, uh, you know, that 
five years, the 150 hours addresses a lot of those knowledge and skills that are necessary today. And I, I will also mention that at its January 2023 board meeting, the NASA Board of Directors unanimously voted in support of that 150 hour requirement. That's great. That's very interesting history, Dan. You know, I've only been with the AICPA for two years. So you've given me great amount of context here. So I appreciate that. And, you know, as I look at the map through the decades, the question I have for you, maybe if you remember from your regulator days, when we were making that transition as a profession, um, what kind of policies were in place to ensure that, you know, states were able to come into a full red map? Were things like temporary uh, permits given out, grandfathering? What was in place for that change and that move to happen seamlessly for the profession? Yeah, certainly you touched on a couple of very important things that happened back in the transition period. One was grandfathering. We certainly didn't require every CPA who was licensed to go back and get 150 hours of education. There was a transition period that was typically five years so that uh, those in the pipeline were not affected by it. And, and then certainly the other important thing is that back in, in that time, uh, a lot of jurisdictions had temporary practice permits that you, you didn't have to worry about the fact that uh, you had to apply for initial license. Instead, you had the ability to apply for a temporary practice permit. And certainly over the last several decades, we've seen a lot of revisions to board statutes and rules that a lot of those temporary practice permits don't exist in most jurisdictions today. That it's really licensure uh, in your home state, your, your principal place of business, and then practice through mobility. That's helpful, thank you. All right, let's move on to my favorite topic, CPA mobility. It's, uh, it's my favorite tool to use with legislators when they yell at me about why CPAs need to be licensed. Um, so, you know, Dan, you and I often discuss mobility given all the legislative issues we do see. And you gave me a great quote. And I think this really, if you wanna give some background on this and you know, for me, this is something that I always tie the profession back to. Um, when you have an agency like the Federal Trade Commission, who rarely gives kudos to anyone, <laughs> point out the profession, I think this speaks volumes. Yeah, I, I, I thought this was a, a great quote. Uh, certainly the, the Federal Trade Commission in September of 2018 uh, came out with a general statement. And that NASPA's annual meeting in November of 2018, uh, as it says there, we had uh, Tara Isa Kozlov, who is the chief of staff at the FTC, uh, come and speak to us at our annual meeting. And she specifically said that, you know, we, the FTC, recognize accountancy as having done mobility and accountability right. Importantly, you are providing disciplinary support beyond state lines. So to have a federal regulator recognize accountancy and the importance of mobility it, it was just, uh, you know, a great shot in the arm for all the things we've been doing over the past two decades. The other thing, Marta, I think that's important, and, and I heard this uh, first before I, I, when I was in New York, before I, I came to NASBA 11 years ago, and I continued here today, that uh, certainly other professions want to know how we did this. Uh, there is not mobility in a lot of other professions. Uh, in fact, you know, there's a nursing compact for 32 jurisdictions, and that's the, the greatest number of, of mobility, you know, within a, within a profession that, that we have outside of accountancy. And, and I've had people in other professions reach out to me and say, how did you accomplish this? And, you know, certainly it's a lot of hard work by all of us, whether it was the AICPA, NASBA, state society, state boards, we work collectively to get to where we are today. And certainly that effort paid, paid us uh, tremendously with recognition like this by the FTC. Absolutely, so let's get to it. What, what makes the profession and the regulation of the profession so great? And it's that substantial equivalency, right, Dan? Yeah, substantial equivalency. You know, it's, it's one of those things, Marta, that I, I hear used quite a bit and many times it's used in the wrong context. Uh, and, and certainly substantial equivalency really points toward the minimum level of competency for licensure. And, and they, are, they are these. You need to have a baccalaureate or higher degree with 150 hours of education, uh, that you need to pass the uniform CPA exam, 
and you need one year of experience verified by a CPA. So it, it's really that standard that applies to, to how we got to 55 jurisdictions being deemed substantially equivalent today. You know, we, we don't dig down and, and people often talk about the differences uh, among state boards with respect to licensure requirements. Uh, these are really the standards that are applied, uh, you know, within the UAA. And I, and I would point out the Uniform Accountancy Act, the UAA, we, Marta, sometimes we talk in acronyms and I got to make sure we, we don't always do that. So the Uniform Accountancy Act is really a, a model act that uh, both the ACP and NASA work together uh, to keep as an evergreen document. And there's also a set of model rules. And both the AICP and NASPA have Uniform Accountancy Act committees, and we jointly meet periodically throughout the year to talk about important concepts, both in the Act and the model rules that may need revisions uh, to keep up with contemporary practice. So these are, you know, it's not like this is a one-off that somebody's in, the, in, a, in a, an office somewhere saying we need to have these standards. This is a collective process through the committee structures within both organizations that bubble up through the Uniform Accountancy Act committees, and then ultimately go to the boards of directors uh, of both organizations with respect to the act and with NASA board of directors with respect to the rules. It goes out to public comment, you know, a judicious process that, where everybody has an opportunity to comment. Uh, and then there's an evaluation of those comments and then ultimate action by the board or boards to move forward with something. So Marta, it's a great inclusive process. And I think it's one that's very, been very beneficial to us as a profession. Absolutely. So it really comes down to those three E's, right? Education being 150 hours, the exam and the experience to be able to travel freely across state lines, but while also maintaining public protection. It's those three E's. And I think a lot of questions that I get too, Dan, is, you know, each state is slightly different, right? There are variations of, you know, courses versus credits for education, or, you know, every state has little things different about it. But do even when those differences exist, does that still mean these states are substantially equivalent? It absolutely does. The, the threshold with respect to education is maintaining 150 hours of, of you know, credit on a transfer. So, you know, it's gotta be accredited college university. Uh, and that's the sole pathway with respect to licensure. Uh, the same with the uniform CPA exam. You know, there's not other exams out there. And, and, and certainly that is what, that, that's what you need to, to pass. That's the bar to entry. And the same with one year of experience. You need that one year of experience verified by a CPA. And, and certainly there are states, for example, that require two years. A number of them are actually looking toward revising uh, in this day and age to that one year threshold. Uh, so, you know, again, as long as you meet that, that minimum, uh, there's no issue with respect to substantial equivalency. All right, thank you for clarifying that. So if we dig in a little bit deeper on the next slide, um, there's individual mobility, right? And there's firm mobility. So let's start with individual mobility and what that entails. Sure. So, you know, certainly individual mo mobility will, will flow, flow into firm mobility in a, in a few minutes. But with individual mobility, if you're licensed in a jurisdiction, you're able to practice across, across state line in a, another state or jurisdiction that is not your principal place of business through mobility. Uh, you have to come from a jurisdiction that is deemed substantial equivalent. And as we mentioned earlier, all 55 jurisdictions today are deemed to be substantial equivalent because they meet those three E's. And you can perform those services either in person, traveling to another state, uh, you can do them by mail. And I don't know how much is done by mail today. I'm sure there's still quite a bit with respect to tax services. You could do it by telephone or other electronic means. And, and certainly a lot of boards today have in the regulations that you need to maintain a presence where the, the client will understand where you actually are located. But those are really you know, some of the principles with respect to individual mobility. And as you can see on the map, 53 jurisdictions have mobility provisions today. Uh, the only two that don't are Hawaii uh, and uh, CNMI, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. 
So if we dig a little bit deeper into that individual ability on the next slide, I know there are some key provisions that need to be met. Um, and I was wondering if we can kind of go to that slide and walk through, this gets a little wonky, but I think these are very important pieces. Sure, so I, I think these pieces are important because this, this lends itself to the public protection aspects, the regulatory aspects of practicing for our state lines. You know, years ago when we first talked about this, it was no notice, no fee, no escape. So if you're driving a car, you don't stop at a toll gate and somebody verifies that you have a license to drive in a continuous state, you have that ability to, to move across state lines. And it's the same thing with mo practice mobility. Uh, you can practice, you know, without notice. You don't pay a fee to do it. There's no toll when you cross the state. You're just driving across or you're practicing across the state line. And, and you know, certainly there's no escape. And I think that's what this comes to. This is the public protection aspects that as an individual who's practicing in another jurisdiction under mobility, you're, you're subjecting yourself to the personal and subject matter jurisdiction and the disciplinary authority of the board where you're practicing. So it's not only your home state where you're, where you're licensed, but it's also any other jurisdiction where you're practicing through mobilities. You also assert by practicing under mobility to comply with the laws and rules in the jurisdictions where you're practicing. And, and here's an important part, I think the third one, is that you cease practice if your license is no longer valid in your principal place of business. So if I'm from state A, Marta, and uh, I find myself in undergoing disciplinary action, and perhaps I'm a full service firm, and I'm an individual who practices, and I have a broad practice range where I do attestation, and I do tax, and my home state disciplines me for my audit work. Uh, sometimes you'll see remedi remedial action where there's a partial suspension of practice rights, where the board doesn't want to close you down completely and suspend you from practicing or put your firm out of business while you serve a six-month suspension or something else. Instead, they may say, look, we want you to take remedial action, and we're going to prohibit you from doing audits for six months, but we're going to allow you to continue to do those other services. And I think the important th point here with that third bullet is that if you lose your practice rights in such a situation in your home state where you can't do an audit, well, you can't go across state lines and do that audit either. So I think it's 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 a very important point in point, and again, it goes again back to that public protection aspect of individual mobility. Absolutely. Thank you. I think these three points are very important and something that we at the AICPA hear um, about often from various practitioners practicing across state lines. So as we kind of dive a little deeper into the next slide, Dan, um, just a couple of two more points that I know you wanted to stress to the audience. Sure. So, so the first point certainly is if, if you're practicing in another jurisdiction, that jurisdiction board needs to be able to, you know, if you could have a complaint lodged against you while you're practicing through mobility, the board in that jurisdiction has to have the ability to provide notice or serve you notice that you've had a complaint filed against you. So that first bullet really says that you're appointing, you're accepting the fact that the board of accountancy where you're licensed will be the agent for notice should another board have to contact you with respect to disciplinary matters. The second one is that uh, you can only perform the test services through a firm that complies with certain standards. And we're gonna to get to those in a minute when we get into firm mobility. It's better defined in a couple of slides. Great, thank you. So that kind of gives us an idea of individual mobility. So then let's then dive into in the interest of time into firm mobility. Um, on the next slide and see sort of, Dan, where the firm mobility provisions play um, a role and how we can speak to um, those states that have it and how that works for the firm and the practitioner. Sure, so th this map shows you the 33 jurisdictions who adopted uh, firm mobility at this point. Oklahoma is red because the bill has been introduced in Oklahoma and they may adopt it, you know, this, this uh, legislative cycle. We'll see what happens. So, you know, under under the Uniform Accountancy Act, any firm must register in a state if it has a physical office and performs the test engagements in that state. Again, these are these are what is defined in the Uniform Accountancy Act. And that, so that's where we're talking about this today. So if a physical office performing a test services, you need to have a, a firm registration. 
if you're a firm that uses a title, CPA or CPA firm, you need to also have a registration in that state. And then if you're a firm without an office and you're offering a renting to test services, uh, you need that registration unless you, you fail to meet these requirements. And why don't we turn to the next slide, which really outlines, and this relates both to practicing through individual mobility and uh, firm mobility as well. And you can see these were defined in, in the Uniform Accountancy Act. Uh, one, you need a simple majority ownership by CPAs. So that's you know more than 50% ownership by CPAs. You need to meet the competency requirements set out in professional standard. The firm needs to undergo peer review. So it has to participate in peer review. It has to perform services through an individual practice privilege. So there's that tie with respect to firm mobility tying back to individual mobility. And then you also have to be able to lawfully perform the services uh, where the individuals have a principal place of business. So again, that, that public protection piece, that if you cannot perform certain services in your home state, you cannot do them through mobility in another state. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Um, can the CPA provide attestation services with the mobility license? I'm not quite sure what that means. Dan, do you know what this question might be getting at? So yes, if, if you have uh, an individual license and you are able to do uh, at test work uh, under UAA, if you are able to do at test work, you haven't been disciplined, and you are going to a state that has firm mobility and your firm does not have a physical location in that state, then you would be able to practice and provide test services in that state without, without a firm registration. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, so thank you for walking us through the firm mobility piece. Now, switching gears, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, with Minnesota introducing legislation, NASBA sent a letter from your legal counsel to us, to the AICPA, outlining a few um, concerns that you and legal counsel had um, on what the potential impact of the bill might be. And so I wanted to take a moment to address those bullets and go through them, Dan, if you don't mind, and speak to um, you know what those items mean for all of the issues that you just covered um, regarding substantial equivalency and mobility and what the disruption to that might be and just speak to the facts and data behind that. So. What if if Minnesota moves forward and the bill is enacted? Um, what would that mean for the state then not being substantially equivalent, Dan, in terms of then that individual mobility that you just discussed? Sure. So we go back more to first to the three E's: substantial equivalency, and and one of those three E's is that the jurisdiction has 150 hours of education. There is no provision for less than 150 hours of education. So if a bill was enacted in any jurisdiction that had a different pathway that resulted in a lower education uh, pathway, then they would not be deemed substantially equivalent to the UA any longer. So what that would mean essentially is that any CPA in that jurisdiction uh, would not be able to practice through mobility uh, the way it's defined today. Uh, what that would mean potentially is that a CPA practicing outside of that jurisdiction would need to have either an individual license or temporary practice permit. But as we've talked about earlier, most jurisdictions no longer have a temporary practice permit provision in the laws because that was you know, an old provision pre 150 hours. So then you say, okay, if, if an individual needs to have an individual license to practice in another jurisdiction, how do they go about doing that? And, and there's really two paths to doing it. One is they would apply for initial licensure in another jurisdiction because that other jurisdiction is not going to know whether that individual CPA has met the 150 hour education threshold or if they were licensed under 120 hour pathway. So that means every CPA in that jurisdiction is going to have to go through that evaluation of education and obtain a license uh, in that jurisdiction. The alternative and, and that's out there is NASBA's Qualification Appraisal Service. And 
Well, that was an opportunity. It's something that really we did during the transition uh, at NASBA when folks were coming from a non-substantially equivalent state, but may have had 150 hours of education. And, and to kind of give you an example, uh, you know, back in the 2000s, when I was with the, the New York board, uh, three of the four big four firms were located, their, the national headquarters were located in New York. And so there were always CPAs coming into New York from other jurisdictions, other licensed license in other jurisdictions who had to get a license to practice in New York. So rather than have them get an individual license uh, and, and then go through the, the process of having to get uh, their transcripts from their college or colleges sent to us, we asked them to go through the NASBA Qualification Appraisal Service because it was an opportunity for them to do that process once, uh, the Qualification Appraisal Service would, would essentially put together a portfolio of the education transcripts, the, the exam grades, and the experience requirements, so that if they wanted to apply for a license in New York or any other jurisdiction, they only had to get those transcripts and the exam grades and the experience once. They didn't have to do it multiple times. So, for example, if I go to I go to your example that if something happened and this bill is enacted in, in Minnesota and a CPA you know works in a in a firm that practices in multiple jurisdictions and they need a license in Illinois and they need a license in New York, well they're going to have to apply for an individual license in both those jurisdictions. So, do you require that CPA to go to their college or university once by using the qualification appraisal service? or twice by applying and getting those transcripts to apply for license in Illinois and apply and get a license in New York. And I've heard some conversation that, you know, NASB is in this for the money. I, I got to tell you, if, if we were in it for the money, you know, we'd be saying, yeah, go ahead, you know, do those alternate pathways because, you know, we can get volume and, and, and charge a fee to do that. We're not, you know, we haven't used this process for quite some time. It was really a transition to 150 hours. We would have to re-engineer it, make sure it's up to speed in order to make that work. And again, the other the alternative is to apply for licensure in that jurisdiction. And do you apply for an individual license in Illinois? Do you apply for an individual license in South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, all jurisdictions where you apply, or you know, do you do it once? So it's really what's the most efficient thing for you? When, so it sounds, go, on, go ahead. So it sounds like, Dan, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I'm trying to, it sounds to me like if a state is not substantial equivalent and I, the CPA, let's say I, I individually am substantially equivalent, I am driving my car out of a state like Minnesota that would no longer be substantially equivalent. And let's say I'm driving into Illinois. If both states are substantially equivalent, I can just drive into that state, not pay a toll, not speak to the nice security guard at the at the border <laughs> and make sure I can come in. Now I do have to do those things, right? If, if through mobility that doesn't exist, I have a driver's license and I'm free to travel around the country, but now with a non-substantial equivalent state, there are certain thresholds that need to be met in order to practice in a jurisdiction. Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely. And, and again, it goes back to the three E's. You know, all jurisdictions today recognize the three E's, you know, the, the education, the exam, and the experience. But once that model in a jurisdiction changes, those other jurisdictions from a public protection standpoint don't know whether you meet the minimum standard that applies in their state or if you have a different standard by which you were licensed. So again, in, in, in your example, yes, you know, it's no longer you're on the freeway and you're just passing right through a state. Instead, you're going to have to stop at the toll booth and uh, you can't do that. No notice, no fee, no escape. Instead, you're going to have to go through a process to have your individual credentials verified to make sure that you can practice in another jurisdiction. And that's, a, and that's thank you, Dan. And that's a good clarification. So to be clear, we're talking about the, the disruption of individual mobility for newly licensed and currently licensed CPAs that are in a non-substantial equivalent state. Because to your point, the boards of accountancy in the surrounding jurisdictions would not know the qualifications of the CPA. Yeah, correct. And, and actually, Marta, it, it's probably even more you know, 
than that. You know, it's not just physically going to a state, but it's going to be virtual work. And if you're you're working with a client, you know, virtually across state lines through the internet, uh, you're going to have the same issue. You can't do that. You're going to have to have, uh, you know, potentially a temporary practice permit, which probably doesn't exist, or you're going to need a license in another jurisdiction. Sign those client engagement applications very carefully if this happens, right, Dan? Um, and, you know, the other thing, Dan, that I often get questions about, it's a great question. So if a state were to adopt multiple pathways to licensure, which is what we're seeing in the proposal from Minnesota, where one of those proposals is the 150 hours plus the one year of experience, could that state and could those licensees still choose the substantially equivalent pathway and still leverage the benefits of substantial equivalency or does then that additional pathway take away to your earlier point of it's it's a lower qualification and it's lower than the 150 hours yes yeah, so that that again Marty, is where you know you potentially are going to have to have a license in another jurisdiction the other way that was approached in the Uniform Accountancy Act, at least through the transition from 120 to 150 uh, in, in section 23 was that you could use NASBA's qualifications appraisal service so that the appraisal service could deem you, you know, evaluate your transcripts, evaluate your exam scores, evaluate your experience and deem you individually substantially equivalent. And then you could, uh, you know, practice yourself through individual mobility. Uh, but again, that's a, a, a tedious process. It's not the way it is today with the no notice, no fee, no escape. You still need to be qualified uh, or pre-qualified before you practice through mobility. And I think that's the biggest differentiator in the, within the profession from other professions or occupations, right? Where it's mobility, it's what we have now where we can go from state to state, especially I would say now virtual practice way even more important than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, Dan. Um, whereas reciprocity, you still have to meet certain requirements and thresholds, and there isn't that free use of cross-border practice, whether it's for, uh, physically or virtually. And I think those two, mobility and reciprocity, are used interchangeably, but they're very different within the profession and what that means for the protection of the public. You know, Marta, you pull out a map of the United States and you look at how many major cities are located on state borders and what the impact of that would have nationally if, if you know, jurisdictions were to lower the bar and not, and not follow what's in the Uniform Accounts Act. And it's going to have a tremendous impact on, on CPAs who potentially are going to be practicing almost on a daily basis crossing uh, state lines under mobility or have that ability to practice on a temporary basis using mobility uh, and, and how they're gonna now potentially would have to go through that evaluation or licensure process. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, so I think one of the follow-ups from that then, Dan, is could you then just transfer your home status to a substantially equivalent state without a res residency requirement, then use the mobility that I get from that? Well, it's mobility is really based on uh, your principal place of business. So it's not as simple as saying, well, if I don't like state A, I'm gonna make my principal place of business state B because they have different licensure requirements. You, you need to have a license in the jurisdiction that you identify as your principal place of business. So, you know, there is no way around it. You can't just say that, uh, Illinois is my principal place of business, even though, uh, you know, in, in your example of Minnesota, Minnesota is where my office is. I can't have an off uh, license in another jurisdiction. Uh, you need to be licensed in that jurisdiction where your principal place of business is. Thank you. And I know principal place of business was a big discussion last year at the regional conferences uh, with with the NASBA and just especially given the virtual work environment. You know, how does one define principal place of business? Obviously, it's within the UAA, but I think, you know, there's lots of questions being raised around that. So I appreciate you clarifying it. And, and we also. Mart, I would just add a, a cautionary uh, piece there about, yeah. uh, about principal place of business. Certainly, there are some jurisdictions uh, 
that say that you need to be licensed if your principal place of business with respect to work is my jurisdiction. And there are a few jurisdictions that also approach that from residency as well. So for those who are on, on the, the webinar today, uh, you need to make sure that you're following the rules uh, in, the, in the, the jurisdiction where you're practicing. Absolutely, thank you. Um, look at the questions, Dan. We have a question. Um, so when you mentioned that they, uh, there are 55 jurisdictions that are substantially equivalent today, the who or what body deems them substantially equivalent and who and what body or bodies define substantially equivalent states. Um, and I think that Dan speaks to your earlier point about how we all work together to do that. But who is the body that deems substantial equivalent states? So it's, it's, it's NASBA's uh, appraisal services. NASBA's, NASBA has a committee that, that looks at that. And uh, that that's really comes through the UAA that, uh, you know, collectively uh, back in the day, the AACPA, NASBA, the boards and the state societies all worked together uh, to make sure that we had defined what substantial equivalency was, those three E's. And, and really that's where everybody is today with respect to, uh, how it's defined. And, and certainly, you know, one could argue that we're going to define it differently, uh, but that certainly would create chaos if we had 55 different definitions, or if boards and societies had different definitions and we had 110 different definitions of substantial equivalency, it'd be absolute chaos. So uh, I, I think, you know, following the process that's been in place for the past, uh, you know, 20 plus 30 years, uh, certainly is the best way for our profession to continue to move forward. Thank you. And Dan, we have a question on CPA ownership. So for CPA ownership, for firm ownership, does that mean in their home state or in the state allowing mobility? So if a state dropped out of mobility, which I think means they would no longer be substantially equivalent, um, then for that personal license, does that take them out of qualifying for 50% firm ownership? It, it would not uh, be, be and, and actually 54 or 55 jurisdictions or 53 out of 55 jurisdictions have, actually, I think it's 54, Marty, you can correct me, have simple majority ownership. So I don't think the ownership provision is going to impact the individual or the firm with respect to uh, the ownership provision. I, I believe only New York today uh, does not have the simple majority provision. My understanding is there's a bill in the legislature again this year, and uh, there's hopes that it, it may move forward uh, this year. But we've had those hopes, uh, you know, for the last decade uh, or more since I was I was with the New York Board of, of passing a bill in, in that manner. So. You know, fingers crossed that we can get to 55 uh, this year, but we'll see what happens. Definitely. Um, another question that came in, and Dan, I'm happy to answer this as well, is uh, a number of states have adopted what the anti-licensure crowd has been proposing in terms of, quote unquote, universal licensing laws. Um, could CPAs avail themselves to that pathway? Yeah, that, that one may be more in your ballpark than mine, Marta. I will tell you that, you know, what it reminds me of is, is I, I go back to the reciprocal license piece yeah. where the UAA has the four and 10 rule that if you're licensed in practicing in another jurisdiction for four out of 10, again, it goes back to substantial fluency, but, uh, you, you know, you simply submit an application for license during the other jurisdiction, you pay the fee for the license, and you, you submit the experience. So it's an expedited way of getting a license from a substantial equivalent state. And, and so you get that license. Uh, you know, there are some jurisdictions now who are revisiting for themselves whether four and 10 is where they want to be. And there are some that are actually looking at it and saying, you know what, we trust what that other jurisdiction is doing when they license somebody with one year of experience. And, you know, we're willing to give them a reciprocal license if we get that you know, verification, certification, attestation, whatever the term of art is in that jurisdiction uh, for licensure to give them a license. But I invite you to really touch upon the universal licensure piece. Oh, yes. Uh, so universal licensure, I think, is one of those ways that um, 
the anti-licensing crowd has come up to sort of give a silver bullet to cross-border practice. And I, I think it is a model that's been adopted in about 18 various jurisdictions and each law that was passed looks absolutely different. Some have residency requirements, some don't. Um, some collect various information, some don't. And so the, the, the real story is that it doesn't actually produce any easy cross-border practice. It actually adds layers of bureaucracy to the process. And so many times when we speak to legislators, we say to them, CPAs will not use this because they cannot travel within the system. They cannot practice within the system. They will use the CPA mobility model because they can get to clients and meet deadlines, <laughs> which would be very difficult under universal licensure provisions. Um, and frankly, I, I'm not sure how much more speed there will be on these universal licensing bills in terms of other jurisdictions adopting because I think the data is coming back on those bills and it's not working as I think it was intended. And so those professions, especially those that we have in our bowl who have mobility provisions, that is the model that works much better for practitioners and the public. Um, another question that we received, Dan, since substantial equivalency is defined in the laws of individual jurisdictions based on the UAA definition, how would the lack of substantial equivalency in a jurisdiction affect the MRAs signed by a jurisdiction? That, that's a great question, Marta. And, and I would think it's going to have an impact, uh, certainly when the MRAs are uh, signed with the foreign licensure body. Uh, it's under the anticipation that uh, the United States, the jurisdiction where that individual is licensed, meets the three E's, because that's where that foreign body is evaluating uh, the U.S. license. So potentially you have the, uh, you may find out that if you have a pathway that is not uh, substantial equivalent to the UAA, that you could end up having that foreign body saying, we're no longer going to be recognizing uh, the license from that jurisdiction for, uh, you know, a, a, a license in that, that country. Yeah, that could cause a lot of problems. Um, another great question, Dan, and I want to be mindful of time, so thank you for all these wonderful questions, is, so, of course, um, substantial equivalency is critical and important to preserve. Um, so how should interested parties request the UAA education rules be reevaluated by NASBA and ICPA as we discuss pipeline. Certainly, I, I think a lot of times, Marta, the the requests for changes come up through the committee structures within the organizations. Whether it's you know the executive committee, uh, I think it's the education executive committee at uh, the academic executive committee at the ACPA or NASBA's education committee. Uh, you know, a lot of times they come up through those committees to uh, the UAA committees for discussion. Uh, they also come up through leadership. Uh, you know, twice a year, uh, AICPA and NASBA leadership meets in what we call a summit, and it's the board leadership as well as executive uh, staff meet uh, twice a year to talk about issues that are, you know, of importance to the profession. So I think there's, there's several ways to either do it through the committee structure, contact somebody within the organizations uh, to do that so, and, and get that get that topic out there and, and, and seek some additional uh, input or research on that topic. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's one of the key provisions of the Earn and Learn Experience Program, right, Dan, that NASB and AICPA are working on together of looking at the educational requirements, looking at how to not disrupt what we currently have in place but also reevaluate that accreditation piece and how can candidates earn that um, while you know working in a firm, going to classes, picking up those classes virtually, and learning at the same time. So I think there's also great firm models out there that keep that 150-hour requirement in place and the substantial equivalency in place while also exposing students to various form work and college requirements. And I think that's something that is very exciting for the profession. I know we're having conversations 
with our various stakeholders. And that's an idea that I think is very exciting in this space to answer that question partially. Absolutely. Uh, we've been working, you know, staff have collectively been working and sharing thoughts and ideas and seeking input from, from both organizations' leadership and, and also sharing thoughts and ideas with our committees and, and, and soliciting input from other stakeholders and, and really trying to refine it. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll be doing a presentation on the, uh, the ELE program. I know we've, we've had different uh, acronyms for that over the last few months trying to finalize it. It is going to be the Education, Learn, and Earn acronym or ELE going forward. Yeah. Uh, we're going to spend about you know 30 minutes on that at the executive director's conference in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've had we've been having discussions, I think, with our various committees, uh, soliciting input as well, and other stakeholders like AAA. Uh, so it's it's very important. The, obviously, the firms uh, and, and educational institutions, uh, and a lot of great input. And uh, you know, I, I think it's really been fairly well received, especially with the firms. Uh, so we're, we're uh, certainly excited to continue to move forward with that project. Uh, and, and it certainly goes to one of the items that is in the AACPA eight-point plan, where it's about communicating, uh, you know, al alternative ways of getting to the 150 hours. I think people sometimes stumble on the fact that they think the only way to get there is by a master's degree. And in the original intent, uh, back in the early days of 150, by not defining it as a master's program, was to provide greater pathways for people who were doing mid-career changes and wanted to become uh, CPAs, uh, or there are other ways for students to get that education to get to 150 hours. I know there's you know issues, concerns about the way it's drafted. We've heard those before. Marta, I'll tell you, there's there's a great paper. Uh, at least in my opinion, a great paper that NASDAQ put together in 2008. Uh, and it was really focused on the SIT 120 license 150 model that was just starting to be rolled out there. But it really is a great, uh, provides great background on the whole 150 hour issue. We've shared it with the executive directors in the past. Uh, I'd be happy to share it with others if, if they want that, that I, I think it's it provides that background and that perspective of how we got to where we are and the importance of, of where we're going. Uh, so I, again, you know, it, it may be 14, 15 years old now, but I think it's still relevant to, to where we are today. Absolutely. It definitely is. Um, and then Dan, we have a really good question going back to your point about the four, the 10 and four rule. This rule is, of course, as you know, in many state rules, and it has variations from state to ten, from state to state. So the ten and four rule allows an applicant, of course, to apply for licensure if they have passed the exam within ten years of licensure application and have four years of experience. Um, these candidates are not required to have 150 hours of college edu education, and um, are those folks deemed substantially equivalent? And if they are it's still, or if they are not, it still requires someone to apply for a certificate, but it also doesn't that apply substantial equivalency to that person. So I think the question is mixing up two things, individual substantial equivalency and state substantial equivalency. So can you go into the four and 10 rule a little bit more? Sure, so, so the four and 10 rule applies if I'm licensed in a state today and I need a license in another jurisdiction. Rather than me being treated as an initial licensee and submitting my college transcripts, and I might be licensed for 15 or 20 years, and I need a license in that jurisdiction because it's now my principal place of business. Rather than me submitting my transcripts and my exam grades and my experience for licensure uh, and going through essentially what an initial an, an applicant for initial licensure would do. Instead, it's treated as an expedited way or an ex expedited manner for licensure for that individual. That instead, I can, if I'm going from a substantially equivalent state, I would ap apply, pay the fee, and I would provide the certification or the verification that I have four years of experience in the last 10 years uh, that would apply. And then certainly the board would evaluate that and issue you that license in the other jurisdiction. 
Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, another question that we received is, what is triggering this effort to make changes to current licensure laws? And were there problems or issues lawmakers are looking to fix? I don't know if it's uh, issues that legislators are looking to fix. Usually, uh, unless there's a major issue, I don't think the legislature really gets involved in the professions. I, I think a lot of what is occurring today is, is a focus on the pipeline. And certainly we're not the only profession that's focused on the pipeline. If you read any of the, the trade journals, you find that you know the healthcare professions, law, the legal profession, uh, or the design professions of engineering architecture, we're all looking at a smaller universe of college, college graduates, and we're all trying to attract them to our professions. And then you also look at the fact that we're competing also with the trades or the occupations that uh, you go out and you look at what a uh, an occupation like a plumber or an electrician, what the starting salaries are for those people in the occupations. And, and you know, for some people, that's more attractive today uh, than going to school for four or five years, depending on or more if you're going to uh, the legal or the or the healthcare profession. So. Uh, there's a lot of alternatives and we're all you know looking toward that that same small universe or population of graduates you know one of the things you know i saw in the last year or so when we were talking about education is that there's going to be a peak in high school graduates in 25 or 26 and there's going to be a trough until the mid 30s and so you know every profession is going to be looking at shrinking college populations so, Marta, I got to tell you, we got to do a better job of selling our profession. Uh, I, 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 you know, watch some of the uh, Super Bowl commercials, and, and I think there was one for, I believe, H&R Block or somewhere else. I mean, while they're not CPAs, I, I believe there was a commercial that had a bunch of cookies with, with guys with white shirts and green ties and glasses on uh, as the tax practitioner. And unfortunately, I think a lot of time... Uh, our profession is equated with green eye shades and, and you know, pencil holders in our pockets. And we got to do a much better job as a profession selling who we are and what we do. Because there's a lot of important, exciting things happening in our right. profession that if you go out and you talk to college students and they hear what's going on, they're amazed because it's not about ticking and tying anymore. It's about a lot of great things that are happening in our profession. Absolutely, Dan, you're 100% right about that. And I think you've painted a very great picture for us today. You know, James and I had a great conversation the other day about all of these pieces, right? And you painted a picture of this is really a giant Jenga piece. And if we start pulling out little pieces here and there, it's all going to fall apart. And to use your word, chaos will ensue. And so I appreciate your perspective and keeping our Jenga model in place and what those key pieces and provisions really mean. Um, and I wanted to thank you for your time. And for folks, if we did not answer your question today, we have them. So we will get back to you on those questions. Please be sure of that. We also recorded this, so we'll be sharing it with those who are not able to join us today. And of course, this is a continuing conversation. So. Dan, I know we have the executive director's conference at the end of the month coming up, um, where I know many of you will be. Uh, we have, of course, um, AICPA council, regional council meetings coming up. And so I know this will be a continuing dialogue. So on behalf of the AICPA and NASBA, Dan, thank you for your expertise. And thanks for everyone for joining us today.